Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Let's dive into today's conversation regarding life's myriad transitions and how we refine our responses in our relationships, our wellness, our households, our work, and in our practices. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today one of my oldest friends in the yoga world from New York for years and years and years, a dearly respected yoga teacher, author of Deep Listening, Jillian Pransky. Welcome to the podcast. Ah, uh, well, thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yes, yes. You're an international presenter. You're a certified yoga therapist. You are the creator of Mindful of Rest, an online retreat, The Art of Conscious Rest, Restorative Yoga Teacher Training, as well as Yoga Journals Restorative 101, No Small Feet. You teach regularly at uh, centers throughout the country, including Kripalu and Omega and Esalen and 1440 and Blue Spirit. You're a student of Pema Chodron's work since 1998, which I didn't actually know. And you infuse your classes for our listener with mindfulness practices, compassion and ease. That I did know. Um, For over 25 years, you've been teaching people all over the world the principles of deep listening through restorative practice and slow flow yoga and mindfulness practice. Heaven, uh, your message is simple but potent. Slowing down, turning inward, and deeply listening to the body and the heart is perhaps the most meaningful form of self-care work we can do. And when we are more compassionate and connected with ourselves, we are able to be more compassionate and connected with the others in our world. I'm really excited to talk to Jillian. Like I said, we've been friends forever. Uh, We see each other often whenever we go teaching at the same places at the same time. It's always such a joy to see you. And um, really, I'm here to talk about your work to the people who might not uh, have known it before, who are my listeners. And I'd also like to talk about your teacher training because I think restorative yoga is the way of the future. And I have personally gained so much from practicing restorative yoga. And I'm really excited to share your work with our uh, listener today. So thank you so much for being here again. Jillian, first question. Um, How did you find restorative yoga? What was the genesis of your practice personally? Mm. So I came to yoga as an athlete. In fact, um, I was a collegiate soccer player. I was on a roller skating speed team as a kid. Uh, What? Yeah. Wait, wait. Truth. First of all, (laughs) wow. We were both roller skaters, but speed is something else. Yeah, like satin jacket roller skating team. Um, Mm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. 1970. That's right. Yes. Yes. um, You know, I was someone who really, really loved to challenge my body. Uh, Handstands made me feel strong and confident. And um, it just so happened that one year, I think it was 1992, actually, I ran the New York Marathon. And um, I ran it as a non-runner, even though I was an athlete. Running was not my thing. And someone said, you should run the marathon because I ran some like 5K race and it was actually such a blast. It was like the most fun I'd had in so long. And someone was like, let's run the marathon. And five months later, I did in the New York City Marathon. And um, wow, it was a mind over matter game. And that I was really good at. But after the marathon, my body caught up with my mind and said, no more. And um, I went through a year of chronic fatigue and all sorts of sickness, and it just so happened I didn't connect the dots at the time, but I was going through a breakup from a a very long-term relationship. There was just a lot going on. And uh, I remember laying down in this propped shavasana, and it was like the first time in my life I realized that I was running myself around 
bullying myself and just pushing myself. And it was this deep, restful pose where I, I actually literally fell apart in, <laughs> as one might imagine. And um, that's how it found me. All of a sudden, I had this intense reflection of why am I always pushing so hard? And why can I not be soft with myself? And softness became from that point forward really my blade of grass, self care, self compassion, softness. I think from that point forward, I never stopped studying that. Yeah. Just in your voice, I can feel what happened there. And I dare say the same thing has happened to many of us where we just had no idea <laughs> what restorative yoga was. And then we find ourselves in a pose one day and, and it's just a revelation of the highest yeah, sort. Yeah, it's, we're not taught how to rest. And for the most part, we've been discouraged. And I don't really even need, I'm sure, to elaborate on that too much is we are all encouraged to do more, to get more, to succeed more, to have more, to be better at everything. And we are just not taught, not by culture, but also not by our families, not by our caretakers, that rest is not only a prerequisite for healing, but it's a way of being able to connect with our true nature, being able to really have a sense of ourselves. We think having a sense of ourselves is what we accomplish, what we get, and we don't know what it's like to have a sense of ourselves by not acquiring. You know, very, very different practice. Yeah. Acquiring nor accomplishing. Yeah. It's hard for us. We were raised in a very particular time women were just making a name for themselves and a voice for themselves. And we were, you know, we're sort of in the wake of that wave and uh, it's hard to get off of it. Yeah, that is a really interesting thing. If you remember, you know, we're of the same time, all of the commercials yeah. that were, you know, yeah. I can bring home the bacon. Oh, no, no, fry it up in a pan. Da, 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 da. <laughs> never let me forget your... The no, never let me forget. Never let me forget your... I'll never let what? you forget. Wait. <laughs> well, we oh, know. Oh, we gotta we gotta look this up. Hold on. I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan, and never let you forget you're a man. Yeah, right. I mean, come on. That's and crazy. and here's the thing is that um that message hit us from every direction. And if we are already sort of good at setting goals and accomplishing things then we have no choice but to get better at doing mm. more. You know, we get better mm -hmm. at whatever we train in. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. That's killer. I can't believe I never realized that beforehand. I like the, <laughs> I like the last <sighs> ring. That is pretty hardcore. I wonder who wrote that. If it was a man or like, I couldn't remember. Clearly a man wrote it. Um, yeah, Clearly. right. I'm sure. That was the advertising world in the 70s, like 60s and 70s. It was all men. Yeah, but you the know... Women were secretaries. What was interesting is, you know, because we had all that encouragement and because our culture of families did not include self-care, you know, we didn't come from the time where we learned self-care within the context of community and family. But because we were encouraged to do much and, and be equal, you know, keep up with the men, the glass ceiling, the whole thing, which, you know, that's for a different conversation. But I happen to have a lot of energy and I happen to be really um, great with willpower and dedication is not a problem for me. So the pushing and the doing, and because I was good at it and got the right accolades and the rewards felt like the right thing. So falling apart and softening and feeling okay just the way I was did not feel like the right thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a story a lot of us can tell. And now we're finally coming around to the fact that uh, there is science behind conscious rest that supports the nervous system and supports the healing of Neurology in the brain, I mean, it's all around us, this work. The science has been incredible. So I have been practicing restorative yoga for 25 years. I've been 
leading teacher trainings for 20 years. And the science was sort of baked into the Eastern philosophy. And everything that I had been teaching for over two decades now, the last decade, we saw the actual data come out in Western science through MRIs, through blood chemistry testing, through EKGs and EEGs and hormone testing, and even just, you know, um, many people's experience of themselves and their healing, lots of brain imaging. None of it was new information for what was always purported that we might experience in rest and relaxation, which sets the conditions for healing. But now we just have the data for it. It's been fascinating to teach a training over, and and you know this, to teach a training over the course of two decades plus and to have data to, you know, pontificate your points that you've already been teaching. It gets so exciting when you can reference the studies, but we really bring a tremendous amount of this into the training. And now also with all of the work on trauma and trauma-informed yoga, um, as well as just all sorts of somatic practices, there's never been a better time for us to understand conscious relaxation and to practice it. And having that, um, you know, that data just really puts a lot of motivation into it for a lot of people. Yeah, for me, it just makes more sense now. I don't miss it, you know. I used to be like, oh, that's nice. And now it's like, oh, no, no. <laughs> if you don't do it, here's what's happening in your body. Yeah, and it's pretty crazy when we really look at the science of, say, the stress response versus the relaxation response and the whole, the the entirety of every system together. Um, you know, I'll start going in a whole other direction because this really excites me. But yeah, um, please. You know, a lot of people think relaxation is a reward. Relaxation is what we do after we've done all the hard work. But, you know, relaxation itself is a prerequisite for rest. And rest is a prerequisite for all of our healing, all of our growth, all of our evolution, and our experience of self. And, dare I say... Our experience of everyone around us changes when we rest consciously because everything in our bodies becomes more uh, receptive, more vast, more spacious, more willing to listen. And that changes all our relations. At least it has in my experience. Yes, yes. I mean, amen. I do think at the sort of the larger lens of my passion for sharing this work, especially in this moment and time, is that when we're not rested, when we can't relax, we're really acting from a place of stress. We're reacting to the world. And when we react to the world from a place of anxiety, of stress, of worry, of concern, our behavior is limited to categories like aggression and avoidance and withdrawal, which you can think about. Like if we're in fight, flight, or freeze, the ways we can respond is aggression, avoidance, and withdrawal. And if we want to not add aggression, not add aggression to ourselves, not add aggression to the planet, not add aggression to our relationships, if we want to help create peace on the planet, how we behave matters. And we can't choose our behavior when we're in the stress response. We're not wired to. So if we want that privilege, that opportunity, that basic right, actually, to choose our response, we need to shift gears and come consciously into relaxation so we can sort of expand our capacity to choose how we want to participate, respond, act, behave towards ourselves and each other. And, um, you know, that's always been the message of this work, but... I feel like I'm on fire. It's urgent right now. This is essential to the way we are communicating and connecting with each other and the world. More than ever. You have um, quite the powerhouse team on your restorative teacher training, which I'm assuming will be something ongoing. Is that true? Yeah. This is is just happening in 2023. No, no. And this is the third year. And um, I expanded this year to bring in Dr. Christiana Wolf 
who I'm really excited about. I met her, um, I've known of her work, but I met her at Omega. We taught in a program this summer together, and she's the author of Outsmart Your Pain. She's a mindfulness teacher trainer in the insight meditation lineage, and um, she's going to do a piece on mindfulness and self-compassion with chronic pain emotionally and physically in restorative yoga. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be great. I have Dr. Gail Parker again this year. She's doing a five-hour workshop within the training on transforming ethnic and race-based traumatic stress and looking at post-traumatic growth. I love her her take on, you know, how we can evolve. And um, Hala Khoury, who she's the author of Peace from Anxiety, which is a great book. She's back again. I've known her the longest, I think, of all of my yoga friends. I think I've known her the longest. Oh, yeah. So you know how awesome she is. So She's dear. just so salt of the earth. I adore her. Wise, wise woman. Yes. And great energy. And, you know, this other aspect of what's really important to me in this work, which is what she will touch on, is we are challenged by rest. And when I say that, it's not just because we're not taught how to do it, but So many of us, most of us, me, me included, and I practice every day, you know, we harbor undigested energy, anxiety, trauma, pain in our bodies, and then we try to relax with that. That's not a thing. We need to learn how to relax when we don't feel so safe or okay. And that doesn't look like stillness. That doesn't look like the beautiful picture of Shavasana on Instagram that can look like a lot of things, but it's a definite pause we need to take to approach this idea, especially with all the memes on social media lately with rest. Everybody has to rest. Everybody has to relax. And it's easy to think of this as another trend or a burden or impossible. So how we approach rest for people who are really walking around, not able to slow down and settle because of what we carry in our bodies is a deep and important path to look at the tools, the techniques, the the concepts under that. And she's going to help me bring that home. Yeah. So I would love to talk a little bit about the science of what happens in our bodies when we rest and there are these cascades of chemical reactions in our bodies. What happens to the body? What happens to the mind? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So where do I start? And do I start on the bad news or the good news? Um, well, go bad news first. And then good news. <laughs> so most of the time, and stress is not a bad thing. We know this too. We need stress. We need cortisol to wake up in the morning, to get our work done, to create things in the world. But we have the same wiring neurologically, the same nervous system as animals. And what happens with animals in the wild and for, you know, from the beginning of time is that they might be in the woods and uh, grazing on some grass and they're what they call, um, they're in this state of mobilizing, this gentle alertness. So they might be eating and then they hear a rustle and they look up and nothing's there. So they go back. When they look up and there's danger, they are supplied instantaneously, like faster than a split second, faster than the time between two heartbeats. They're given everything they need to fight or flee or freeze, play dead. And that whole cascade of hormones and chemistry is meant to last about 90 seconds. And within those 90 seconds, they've either eaten or been eaten. They've either had dinner or they were dinner. And and we are running on that same system. And there's a bigger story to this. I'm really simplifying it. But the point being is that once we've gotten away after those 90 seconds, we might be up the tree safe, but we don't go, oh, I'm safe. We all of a sudden start turning our attention to you know, whether it's global warming or our mortgage or that terrible look we got across the dinner table or the fact that our kid isn't listening to us and going to a rave again or whatever it is, we might ruminate about the past or the future. And we take that 90 second hit of chemistry and we replay it and replay it and replay it and replay it. And we're flooded with chronic stress. And what that does to every single system in our body, when we look at it, 
Um, and I'll just take the five most major systems, you know, besides it's shutting off and destroying our digestion, shutting off our immunity, literally shutting off our growth and repair, our reproductive system, our, um, what else? Like all of it. Endocrine circulation, uh, eliminative. All of it. Yeah. And all of our rates go up and 90% of our doctor visits, most modern diseases, pre-pandemic that is, we were dying of diseases of the nervous system, of overdrive in the stress response. And what happens is when we begin to, to learn even just a few tools, you know, very simple things, we can bring it down to finding support, literally the ground underneath us, the props the earth, what we're resting our body on. And ultimately that, you know, metaphorically grows into support in so many different ways, but we can land on the ground. We can return to our breath, which becomes the real key. Once we start breathing deeply, it tells our brain we're safe. We start this whole switch of events in our body. We sort of turn the lever of what's what's called the, the vagus nerve. And once we do that... The vagus nerve being the longest nerve in the body... That passes through the digestive tract, so it's really important to keep that one toned. Yes, and it literally goes from the brain stem through every single organ all the way into the gut. You know, that's another meme that goes around a lot is the vagus nerve on our social media, and it's brilliant. Read every post you see and read a lot about it because what's most interesting that we learn about the vagus nerve is, sure, we can think we're safe. But the vagus nerve goes from the brain stem through the body and into the gut. And 80% of our serotonin is in the gut. So here's the thing about relaxation. It's from the body up to the brain that our biggest bang of turning on the relaxation response happens. So when we relax our body and the environment in the gut is healthy, we send messages up the vagus nerve to the brain to begin to turn on what we call the relaxation response. We begin to turn on the organs and the systems for longevity and health and healing, which were shut down previously by the stress response. And, um, you know, this becomes one of the great things about relaxation. We do shavasana, when we do guided body scans, when we learn how to release habitual tension in our body, we are literally creating an environment in our body to tell our brain that we're in a safer situation. And then we go from the brain back down again to further it. So like we think, oh, we just have to think we're safe or think or stop ruminating or think better thoughts, but it's a whole body-mind connection. Mm. That is really helpful for our listener and me to know. Thank you so much. If you had to name the most important fact that our listener needs to understand right now about making sure that restorative yoga or restoring of any kind happens, what would it be? Hmm. Well, I'm going to bring this back to the title of my book, Deep Listening, because yes, restorative yoga is great for our health. And, you know, I love to share that for hours and hours. But when we learn to relax, what we're really learning how to do is to actually be with ourselves, to visit with ourselves. And why that becomes important is we begin to notice the way we treat ourselves, the way we care for ourselves or not, the way we receive ourselves or not. And it's actually the way we attend to ourselves. It's the way we listen to ourselves that will either leave us feeling as though we've been cared for or as if we need to protect ourselves. It's the manner, it's the attitude we have for ourselves, the care that either leaves us feeling more soft and open or more hardened and closed. And we walk around all day wanting to feel supported, wanting to feel nourished, wanting to feel resourced and loved and cared for. But we can really begin to understand that that practice begins with being that way with ourselves on purpose. And that is the work of restorative yoga. And it's not easy training. It's not easy training to be sweet and compassionate 
with ourselves in this way, but this is really um, the heart of my personal practice. Yeah, I'm glad we got to that. That is a very subtle and very important uh, distinction, that it's really the way that we approach ourselves, not just that we do it. Right, right. It's what we're really cultivating. It comes down to not only that self-compassion, but uh, being stewards of ourselves. And we know, you know, how we treat ourselves and what we do to create a sense of ease and an environment where we feel loved and loving, it affects how we behave. It affects how we contribute, you know, in the world, in our lives. And that ripples out. However we feel ripples out. You know, I think what I'd like to do now, I had a couple more questions, but I I feel like we've just gotten to the heart of the matter, and I would like to talk about your training, if I may. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, This restorative yoga training is actually virtual, and I know that I have so many people who listen who are interested in taking trainings, either virtual or in person, but this one happens to be virtual. It's been going on for a long time. It's centered in the latest research in Western medical science, where and how it intersects with Eastern philosophy. It focuses on creating sessions that harness the therapeutic impact of restorative yoga to create balance, reduce stress, nurture inner quiet, create conditions for self-awareness, for compassion, for healing. I want to list a few of the things that you'll learn in this training, because I think that's important. Uh, Anatomy of the nervous system, so as vagus nerve, respiratory system, with a focus on their relationship to each other, how they all react together when stress is present. Uh, Neurological, physical, psychological, energetic principles of working with restorative yoga teaching methodology, including propping, sequencing, touch, and more. You'll experience... Unique verbal cueing to guide students into deeper relaxation. I would like put four highlighters on that. Jillian is so skillful and experienced at that, as you've heard already. You'll get an introduction to trauma-informed yoga and using somatics for deeper relaxation. That's Hala's world, and she's the best. You'll address race-based trauma in restorative practices, which do come up. Uh, with Christiane, uh, Dr. Christiane working with chronic pain, moving past PTSD to PTG, which is post-traumatic growth. Your training, if you choose to take it, includes live vir- virtual lectures, discussion, mentorship sessions, posture clinics, tutorials, practices, experiential teaching. If you don't know Jillian yet, you can trust you are being put in the hands of a consummate professional. She has forums, she has check-ins, classroom hours supported by assisting teachers. It's serious, serious. So I'm telling you all about this because I personally would really like to take it, but I can't because of my time constraint, but I will at some point. I think I'm just going to buy it and do the recordings. As my listener, you're privy to a special code which takes off $150 from this training. So keep that in mind. Elena Restores, all caps, means that you get $150 off of the training. So I want to make sure you have that information in a timely fashion. Jillian, is there anything else that you would like to add? Mm. Well, this is my life's work and my passion. And, you know, I've been offering this training, like I said, for over two decades, and it grows every single time we gather, it brings together people from not only all over the world, especially now that it's virtual, but, you know, doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and social activists, trauma specialists, teachers, parents, and everybody contributes. So what I really love is that each time the training grows with so many different points of view and the way um, everybody brings their own experience to it. Yes, everybody learns so much new information. Of course, the recordings are beautiful because you have the whole program for an actual year. 
Uh, and I know that people like to rerun it and rerun it to really soak in. But it's also really special to learn so much new stuff and uncover deep inner knowledge that was always there. And I think that that becomes a profound part of this training too, is that sometimes we just don't have the conditions, the space to slow down, to open up, and to let a really deep wisdom that is already inside of us be revealed to ourselves. And there's something magical about restorative yoga and this training and coming into community where we do uncover each of our own innate wisdom. Mm. I can't thank you enough, sister. I want to tell our listener where to go for more information. It's at Jillian's website, which is J-I-L-L-I-A-N, Jillian Pransky, P-R-A-N-S-K-Y dot com. And just put forward slash training, Jillian Pransky dot com forward slash training. Again, all caps, Elena Restores means $150 off. If you've been dreaming about teaching restorative, practicing restorative, developing your own personal, very consistent practice. This is your girl. Mm -hmm. Jillian, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. I'm just going to add one last thing is that um, the CECs are available through Yoga Alliance and through the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And I didn't get to shine a light on Tracy Stanley, who's going to be offering a Yoga Nidra segment, and also (gasps) Lisa Weinert, who's offering... uh, narrative healing and just about how learning, touching into and sharing our own healing story is how we can access that through deep relaxation. So I want to make sure to highlight their work as well. You know, Tracy's become a really good friend to me. Yeah. You guys are out there in that beautiful Santa Fe. Dude, she's everything. Mm, Yeah. That girl is so gifted. She has a body of work that is so special that uh, you are very lucky to have her on your training there. Yeah, and, and talk about her title, Radiant Rest. She is some bright soul. Ridiculous. I use it all the time for myself, uh, and I read it a lot for classes, mm. you know, especially privates, too. She knows it. I was like, so is it okay if I read from your book, <laughs> your practices to my students? And she was like, that's the whole point. Mm. So the title of that is Radiant Rest. Uh, Let's also review. Your book is called Deep Listening. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Website, JillianPransky.com. Training, once again, JillianPransky.com forward slash training. Thank you so much again, Jillian. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Alina. Thank you so much. It was a joy to share. Thank you. Thank you.